Okay, so before I go any further, I'm going to step back again. <laughs> and when I step back now, I'm going to show you how to find the basis vectors. Before I just said, here are the basis vectors, this is what I do with them. But, but for sure, what I owe to you is a way to find out what those basis vectors are. And uh, finding basis vectors is a problem that pops up all the time in mathematics, and we have a great solution known as the Gram-Schmidt process that lets us take a collection of, in our case, symbols, and we take that collection and we find basis vectors, and in fact, we find orthonormal basis vectors to represent that space that, that spans all of those symbols. So the Gram-Schmidt process, it's like a recipe. It's real easy. You just have to follow step by step in order to get your basis vectors. So the objective is to generate an orthonormal basis for our M signal. So we start out and we have M signals. Remember that example I gave you before? Three uh, symbol, uh, symbols and three uh, time varying signals uh, that represented each one of those symbols? Well, you start from that. That's what you know. And what do you have to do? Now here's step one in our recipe. We first find the first basis vector. And the first basis vector is easy. We just pick one of our symbols. So we say this symbol, that's going to be our first basis vector. Because I want it to be orthonormal, I've got to normalize the energy to one. So what I do is I calculate what is the energy of this first symbol, that's E1, and then I divide by the square root of E1. So that forces this symbol, this uh, basis vector, to have a uh, unit energy. So that's by construction. So I take the first symbol and I normalize it. Time to move on to step two. Step two of my recipe is I take the next uh, symbol. So I have M of them. I use the first one for the first basis vector. I take the second one and I'm going to use that to make my second basis vector. And what I do is I take the second symbol but I subtract from that second symbol, I subtract the part of that um, symbol, two, that was already represented by symbol one. Okay, and so there's a way I can say that. I can say we remove the um, part of the second signal that falls into the signal space that was d d spanned by S1 of t. Another way we can call it, another way we can uh, uh, say that in words is that I am taking the projection of S2 on S1 and I'm subtracting that so that all that's left in S2 is the part that cannot be represented by S1. All these words in uh, equation form, it's quite simple. I take the inner product of the second symbol with the first basis vector, Okay, calculate what is that integral, I get a number, I multiply that number by C1, and I subtract that from S2. That means that by construction, I am creating something that is going to be orthogonal to C1. If I remove from S2 the part of S2 which is already represented by C1, then what's left will naturally be orthogonal to C1. So that means by construction, C2 is orthogonal to C1. Now the last step after I get this intermediate step, which is theta 2, which is S2 minus the projection of S2 onto C1, so the, the, the new or orthogonal part of S2, I take that part and I calculate its energy and I normalize it. So now I have a second basis vector, which by construction is orthogonal, and by construction I normalize it so that it has unit energy. Next step, what? just like the previous step, so I just keep going on to the next uh, basis vector, but I don't just do the previous, most, uh, most previous um, projection, I do a projection for all the previous steps. So here I'm up to the ith step in the process, the Gram-Schmidt process, so I'm coming up with an intermediate ith result, and I take the ith symbol, and I subtract from it a projection of that ith symbol on each one of the basis vectors which I've already found. So I'm taking SI and I'm subtracting from it a projection onto each one of the previous basis vectors. So everything which is not orthogonal uh, to each one of these basis vectors is going to be left uh, behind because I'm taking out everything which falls in the space already of those. So what's left 
doesn't fall in that, that space. So I have this intermediate step, uh, ci of t, I calculate its energy, and I normalize this waveform uh, by that so that it has a unit energy. And that becomes my ith uh, basis vector. Now, when you're doing this process, at some point, you're going to get a ci that equals zero. It might be at the last step. It might be that you get all the way through and you're on the mth step. You had m basis uh, ba uh, symbols, and you keep getting basis vectors, keep getting basis vectors, all the way to the mth. Uh, and, then, um, and then you're done, because once you have m, that's it, that you've defined the whole space. But it's possible that, like I said, the number n, which is the uh, n is equal to the dimension of the signal space. And that signal space, uh, that dimension, could be less than m. When it is less than m, you will get a basis vector which pops out and it'll be zero. Okay, just go on to the next step. Uh, so that, why, when does that happen? When does that happen? That happens, you can see right here what will happen. When is it that I'm going to get a zero for my intermediate step? So ci equals zero. When does that happen? That only happens when si of t is a linear combination of other symbols. So it's possible that one of the symbols, well, I could just write it as like symbol 1 plus 3 times symbol 2 or something like that. That means that they are not linearly independent. They're linearly dependent, and there are uh, at least one. If there's something that comes to 0, that means that one of the symbols could be written as a linear combination of the other symbols. So now I get to return back to our example, and I'm going to use the Gram-Schmidt process on these three waveforms that I showed you earlier. So I've got the first one, symbol one, uh, traced in red here, blue and yellow. And in the red one, we can see that if I wanted to write the um, equation for this um, symbol, that it would be one for t between zero and one, minus one for t between one and two, and zero for t between two and three. So I have written the equation for each one of these symbols. So now I'm going to take this collection of symbols, and I'm going to apply the Gram-Schmidt process. So Gram-Schmidt's process, step one, start with the first symbol. So I take the first symbol, here I wrote it again, what that first symbol looks like, just to remind you, and I say uh, it's going to be symbol one, but I have to normalize it. So the first step is normalizing it. So I calculate what is the energy in that waveform. And so the energy is the integral from 0 to 3, because 3 is the, the um, symbol interval, of s1 squared. s1 squared, well, it's easy. Between 0 and 1, it's 1. And 1 squared is 1. Between t equal 1 and 2, I have minus 1. And minus 1 squared is 1. And of course, between uh, 2 and 3, it's 0. So I don't need to do that. So now I have the integral between 0 and 1 of 1. That gives me 1. The integral between minus uh, between 1 and 2 of 1 gives me 1. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Fine. Now I've got e1. So I just take s1 and divide by the square root of e1, which is square root of 2. So I have the original equation for s1. It's just now, instead of having amplitude of 1 and minus 1, the amplitude will be 1 over the square root of 2 up here, and minus 1 the square root of 2 over there. OK, so I have my first basis vector. Time to move to step two. For step two, I take the second basis vector and I subtract the projection of the second basis vector onto the first, uh, excuse me, the second symbol onto the first basis vector. So first basis vector, I rewrote over here. Remember, one over the square root of two minus one over the square root of two. And this is S2. So in the step two A, I'm going to do the projection. I'm going to say, what is the projection of this second symbol onto that first basis vector. And the projection is the inner product. And the inner product is the integral from 0 to 3 of the product of these uh, two 
uh, time varying uh, signals. So, uh, integral from 0 to 3, I divided into integral from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 3. And in the integral from, uh, interval from 0 to 1, s2 is 0. And in the inter interval between 2 and 3, c1 is 0. So it's really just the interval, integral between 1 and 2 that's going to give me a non-zero result. And in between 1 and 2, s2 is 1. And c1 is minus 1 over the square root of 2. So therefore, the result of my integration is minus 1 over the square root of 2. So I take that number, that, project, uh, that inner product, and then I form the projection, which is this inner product multiplied by the original basis vector. So this is my intermediate result, c of 2, which is going to be s2 minus, uh, minus 1 over the square root of 2 of c1. Okay, so now I have this function of time minus, uh, minus 1 over the square root of 2 of this function of time. So I have to calculate, and what does that give me? What function of time do I get? So here is s2. Here is uh, 1 over the square root of 2 c1, minus minus, the cancel out. So now I'm just adding these two, and 0 plus 1 over the square root of 2 gives me 1 over the square root of 2 between 0 and 1. I have uh, 1 minus a half, so that gives me a half. Again, I have the same half, but now it also covers 1 to 2. And finally, minus 1 and 0 gives me minus 1 between 2 and 3. I have my c2, and the next step is to normalize it. So now I take this function and I calculate what is the energy of this function. And of course, I take the square over each one of the integrals, in intervals, and I come up with 3 halves. So the second basis vector is the intermediate result, this function, but I have to divide by uh, 1 over the square root of 3 halves. So I end up with uh, a function which is 1 over the square root of 6, between 0 and 2, and is minus 2 over the square root of 6 between 2 and 3. We move on to the third step. So we take the third symbol, but we have to subtract from the third symbol the projection of the third symbol onto the first basis vector, and we have to subtract the, the projection of the third symbol onto the second basis vector. So, we have two calculations to do. We have to do this red calculation and the blue calculation. So now we reach uh, step three. And what do we do in step three? We take the third uh, symbol and we subtract from the third symbol the projection of the third symbol onto the first basis vector and the projection of the third symbol onto the second basis vector. So we're taking out all the parts that are not orthogonal to these, so that at the end, this intermediate result, sigma 3, will be, by construction, orthogonal to both c1 and c2, because the part that could be projected on them are going to be subtracted from it. So we start with the first step. So we start with uh, c1, uh, which is defined here. And we find the inner product of s3 with c1. So we have three uh, intervals. Uh, to evaluate, and so we enter into each one of these intervals the value of C1 and the value of S3, and we do the math and we arrive at uh, this inner product, which is 3 over the square root of 2. So we do the same calculation again, now for the projection onto C2. I've written up here again what C2 is. Again, we have the three intervals of definition, and we enter into this Again, the same values for uh, S3, uh, the third uh, symbol, and now the values for the uh, second uh, basis vector. We do the math and we get 3 over the square root of 6. So now we have calculated each one of the projections, and what we have to do is we have to subtract from the third, base, uh, the third symbol the projections onto the first two basis vectors. So that's what we're seen doing here. Here is S3. We subtract this projection, and remember the, uh, um, the inner product was minus 3 over the square root of 2, and in this case it was 3 over the square root of 6. And again, we do all the math, and voila, we arrive at a, the third basis vector being 0. That's because this S3 is the sum of this projection plus this projection. 
S3 is a linear combination of S1 and S2 because it's a linear combination of C1 and C2, which are in each one of those linear combinations of S1 and S2. So the Gram-Schmidt process stops. Instead of having dimension 3, m equal 3, because we have one of our steps in the Gram-Schmidt process which gave us a 0, we have a lower dimensional space. And in fact, this um, space, signal space, is a two-dimensional signal space instead of a three-dimensional signal space. So we started with three symbols. It's possible the signal space could be as large as dimension 3. However, during the Gram-Schmidt process where we're developing our basis, we arrive at a step where the intermediate, C, is equal to zero. And because it's equal to zero, our Gram-Schmidt process says there is no contribution because this symbol could be a linear combination of previous symbols. Therefore, the dimension stops. In this case, there are no more symbols. We stop the whole process. And it is of dimension two uh, for this collection of symbols. And so we have our two-dimensional basis. And our two-dimensional basis has two basis vectors. And these are the two basis vectors that we have found with the Gram-Schmidt process. So now, I want to show you that this gives you a vector space representation. So, what do I want to know? I want to know what the signal coefficients, what is the vector representation of each one of them? First of all, we've already calculated the inner product of the first one and C1, first symbol and the first basis vector. We've calculated that in a previous step. We can look back on the slides. We got the square root of 2. By construction, all of the other uh, inner, inner products are going to be 0 because the Gram-Schmidt process builds things that way. So the first vector has a first coefficient, which will be the square root of 2, and all the other coefficients are going to be 0 by construction in the Gram-Schmidt process. Now we'll go up to the second um, uh, symbol, and we calculated the inner product of the second symbol with C1, in the previous step. We found that uh, minus 1 over the square root of 2. We still have to calculate the um, inner product with the second uh, basis vector. And so, of course, we have the equation for what is the inner product. It's this uh, integral. The integral is broken into different regions of definition. And we do the math and we come up at 3 square root of 6. Therefore, we know that the coefficients for the second symbol are minus 1 over the square root of 2 and 3 uh, over the square root of 6. Finally, for the third symbol, uh, we have already calculated the projections onto the two uh, basis vectors, so we already have these coordinates. So now we have the coordinates for the um, vector version of each one of these symbols. So the first one was the square root of 2, 0, with the two coefficients. For the second one, it was minus 1 over the square root of 2 and 3 over the square root of 6. And for the third basis vector, it was 3 over the square root of 2 and 3 over the square root of 6. I have my representation in signal space. And I can plot them. So here is symbol 1. Here is symbol 2. Here is symbol 3, represented in this vector space. Now I start looking at the lengths of these vectors, and I say, hmm. Just graphically, I can see that the S3 is much longer than the other two. And in fact, I can calculate uh, what is the energy by using the equation for the, th the L2 norm. The L2 norm says I take the uh, um, sum of the squares to get the length squared. And so if I just use the uh, coordinates that I have calculated already, I can calculate what is the energy in each one of these uh, symbols. And in fact, I can look at the length. I can calculate the length. And I can see that the length of S1 and S2 are both square root of 2. Yeah, they look about the same length. But the um, third one is much longer. And we can quantify that. It's the square root of 6 instead of the square root of 2. So I multiply by the square root of 3.